I greet you, the true connoisseurs of antiquity and, of course, travel. My amazing stay on the Crimean Peninsula continues. In the last episode, I managed to tell a lot about the history of the Crimean Tatars and about the largest city of the peninsula, Simferopol. But there is still a lot of interesting things waiting for us. I present to you a place full of history and mysteries. The city of Bakhchisarai. This truly land of plenty has been inhabited by people since ancient times. Each era leaving behind itself traces of the most diverse, amazing civilizations has turned Bakhchi Sarai into a real open-air museum. This ancient city located between the cliffs of the ridge of the Crimean mountains impresses with its ancient architecture, historical buildings and man-made caves in the cliffs. I would call Bakhchisarai the heart of the Crimean Peninsula, and this is unlikely to be an exaggeration. In world history, this city is primarily known as the more than two centuries old capital of the Crimean Khanate. When and how did the Crimean Tatars appear as a nation? I studied this question for a long time. In ancient times, the Crimean Peninsula was inhabited by many tribes. Over time, they formed three sub-ethnic groups. The first includes the peoples of the southern coast, Yali Boilu. They inhabited the seashore in the south of the peninsula. The formation of this group was greatly influenced by the Greeks, Goths, Turks and Circassians. The second group, the Tats, was formed from the tribes inhabiting the mountain ranges. Scientists agree that the ethnogenesis of this people is very complex and has not yet been fully studied. According to some sources, the appearance of this sub-ethnos was influenced by all the people and tribes that lived in the Crimea. Among them, suggestively, there may be Turkic peoples, namely the Kumiks, the Kakasas and the Azerbaijani Tats. The third group is the Nogais, the true children of the steppes. This ethnos consists of Western and Eastern Kipchaks. Over time, representatives of these ethnic groups, in accordance with their place of residence, began to call themselves the Crimeans, and the addition of Tatars appeared during the time of the Russian Empire, when all Turkic peoples generalized this term. As it turned out, during the study, initially the Crimeans inhabited a town in the foothills called Kirkya, the current Chufut Kale. I thought that such a symbolic place simply should be seen with my own eyes. Therefore, I went there with a local resident, Mehmet, whom I met recently. We have had a fascinating conversation during our trip. We are heading to one of the oldest fortifications on the territory of Bakhchi Sarai. It is located in the mountains. I am eager to show you these stunning landscapes. Mehmet, tell me, how many tourists visit Bakhchi Sarai annually? Many tourists come to us. I go to Chufut Kale every day, two or three times a day. 
Of course, there are many historical places in Bakchi Sarai, and which of them can be called the favorite attractions of the guests? Tourists love historical monuments, and we have a lot of them. Chufut Kale is an ancient rock city. There is also a Khan's palace and madrasa. Yes, the road here is a match for historical monuments. Will it take a long time to get there? Yes, the road can tire, but it's worth those wonderful views when we get there. Despite all the difficulties, we still got to the destination. I am in the Chufut Kale Fortress, the first capital of the independent Crimean Khanate. The town of Chufut Kale appeared in the 5th, 6th centuries and was under the influence of the Byzantine Empire. Ancient settlers built their homes in the holes right inside the rocks. Just imagine, ancient people lived in such caves. Without light, without heating, without internet, mobile phones and TV sets. And how long they could survive without all this? But such a life had its advantages. Imagine, you don't have to pay every month for light, water and heating. Even houses are free. If you need a dwelling, find a suitable rock, dig a cave and live for your pleasure. In 1298-1299, Emir Nogai attacked Chufut Kale and the city was ruled by the Golden Horde. In the 14th century, along with the Crimeans, the Kairites began to inhabit these lands. At this time, Kirk Or became the capital of the Crimean Ulus, and power in it passed into the hands of the daughter of Toktamesh, Janike Kanu. And this is the famous mausoleum of the ruler. Janike Kanum, the daughter of Toktamesh, was a rather influential, authoritative woman during her reign. She became one of those people who helped Haji Gerai to achieve his power. That is, she supported him to become the Crimean Khan. When she died, Haji Gerai certainly lost the support of the powerful Kanum. But she had her influence after her death, as a sign of great honor and respect to her, they built a dube, which is in the background. Having heard such information, I started wondering who is Haji Girai? This great person is the Crimean Khan. After the death of Janike Kanum, Haji Girai lost power and was forced to hide in the Principality of Lithuania. However, after four years, he gathered a large army, returned to the Crimea, and in 1441 again sat on the throne. Then, and thanks to this, an independent Crimean Khanate was created and Chufut Kale, or Kirk Or, became its capital. From this place, a new era of the Crimean Tatars began. Trade revived, Chufut Kale became one of the richest cities. I was interested in why the Khan chose Kirk Or as the bet. It turned out, the whole thing is geographic. The city is a real natural fortress, representatives of other nations could get here by the only road through the forest. On all other sides, Chufut Kale is surrounded by mountains.
Soon, for the convenience of receiving ambassadors and rulers of other countries, Haji Girai moved his residence to a place called Salachik near Bakhchisarai. In 1446, for unknown reasons, Haji Girai died, and his place on the throne was taken by the son of Mengli Girai. The mausoleum of Haji Girai has a special place among the historical monuments of the Crimean Tatars. Three of his followers, who continued the policy of the first Khan, are buried here as well. Since this is a sacred place, you cannot enter the mausoleum. But I immediately noticed a gilded Arabic script at the entrance. As far as I managed to find out, it says here, in 1501, the great Khan, the famous Khan Khan, the ruler of the world, Mengli Girai, ordered the construction of this sacred and beautiful mausoleum. It was the son of Haji Girai. This is how the Crimean Tatars respected their rulers. During archaeological excavations, scientists discovered a memorial complex in the Salachik settlement. The skeletons of mosques, ceramic water pipes, the remains of fountains and the walls of the Hammam baths. All this testifies to the high level of development of the inhabitants of Salachik. And the main value of the settlement is Zinjeli Madrasa, which has survived to this day. Khan Mengli Girai gave a decree on the construction of this madrasa in 1500. Here, religious leaders educated and trained young people. But why is the Zinjeli Madrasa called? I thought a lot about it. The answer to this question is a kind of Khan's philosophy. As you can see, an iron chain is located at the entrance. What is it for? Everyone who enters the madrasa must bow their heads. By this, a person shows respect for knowledge. Zinjeli Madrasa was a large center of Muslim religious education for more than four centuries, right up to the Soviet era. Of course, there are many historical monuments in the vicinity of Bakhchi Sarai. This place is a witness to so many ancient civilizations, it can tell many stories. Therefore, I head to the world-famous, the only Khan's palace, an example of ancient architecture of the Crimean Tatars. This is the Palace of Gardens, Bakhchi Sarai, the residence of the Crimean Khans. Yes, it was the name of this palace that was later given to the city that grew around it. Thus, thanks to the Crimean Khans, the city of Bakhchi Sarai arose in due time. This palace, the construction of which began in the 16th century during the reign of Khan Saib Girai, is distinguished by its architecture. The complex includes the main building, the palace square, the Khan's mosque, the Falcon Tower and the baths of Sari Guzel. Most of the Bakhchi Sarai palace was reconstructed over time, but I searched and found an unchanged example of the 16th century architecture. Here is the portal of Demir Kapa. That is, in the translation, Iron Gate.
Hotel de Mir Carpath, the creation of the Italian architect Alasio Lamberto de Montagnano. But the Iron Gates in 1503 were built in another place. Only later they moved from the palace to the Kunz Palace. Each ruler contributed to the construction of the palace gardens. Thanks to this, today we can admire such architectural monuments as the Kunz Mausoleum, a meeting room and a golden fountain. By the way, the Kunz Palace is famous for its numerous fountains. The most famous of them is the Fountain of Tears. In 1820, Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin walked along this corridor, who later wrote the poem The Bakchisarai Fountain. The muse was very famous Fountain of Tears. From the beginning, his story was such that Kirim Garai Khan fell in love with a young girl, Dilara Bikach. She was his concubine. The Khan had deep feelings for Dilara, and he suffered for a long time after her death, and he wanted to make his suffering be embedded in stone. To do this, he invited the Iranian master Omer, who was ordered to build a fountain that would show all his pain in a man's heart. How a man's heart cries. Then Omer erected the fountain of tears from marble. Legends say that Dilara was poisoned by the first wife of Kirim Girai. Such palace intrigues took place there. In 1733, during the war of the Crimean Khanate and the Russian Empire, Bakchisarai was conquered by Field Marshal Christoph Minicht. He ordered to burn both the palace and the whole city in order to wipe it off the face of the earth. However, before that, he ordered a description of the palace. This document is still being kept. The fire affected most of the wooden buildings of the palace, only the halls of the council and the court, mosques and the portal of Alevis have survived to our times. Later, Selai Met Girai and Kirim Girai participated in the restoration of the palace. Unfortunately, this is not all the difficulties that the Crimean Tatars have faced. During the Great Patriotic War, these people underwent deportation. Just imagine, in just two days, the entire Turkic population of the Crimean Peninsula was forcibly expelled to the Central Asian republics. Old-timers say that in some houses, they later found tables set for dinner, at which people did not have time to sit down. But the patriotic Crimean Tatars eventually returned to their homeland and to this day are working to revive the forgotten history, their culture and customs. Today turned out to be very informative, but Bakchisarai does not cease to amaze. When I asked the locals where to spend the night, they told me something very important. It turned out that my compatriot Bakut Gul lives here, and she has her own hotel. Of course, I gladly went there. Bakit Gul Kanim, I have such a question for you. Kazakhstan is 4,000 kilometers far from here, and you live in Bakchi Sarai. How did it happen? 
This is a long story. During the Soviet Union, borders used to be common. I went from Kazakhstan, from Jambil, to study in Western Siberia, in Tomsk. It turns out, at the same time from Uzbekistan, my future husband Mustafa went to study to Tomsk. And so we met and married. And since then, we are together. During the time of perestroika, the Crimean Tatars were given such an opportunity. Maybe the Crimean Tatars themselves felt that they had such an opportunity to return to their historical homeland. And since then, since 89, we had been here in Bakhchi Sarai. Is it difficult to be a daughter-in-law of the Crimean Tatars? Maybe we should take you back. <laughs> take me. I have been married long enough. And for this, I know for sure if I didn't like it, I probably wouldn't live and stay here. I really love these people. I respect them very much. People who, despite everything, they always work. People for whom the family is on the first place, parents and children, come first of all. Those laws which are also valuable for us, Kazakhs, and have always been. Thank you for your hospitality. You met me not as a compatriot, but a relative. Thank you very much. What a smell! Hello, what are you preparing? Would you mind if I sat here with you? You're welcome. Take a seat. Dear car names, let me introduce myself. My name is Yashat. I came from Kazakhstan. Now I'm doing a research on history and culture of the Crimean Tatars. What are your names? My name is Najiye. Lutfiya, very nice to meet you. As I am hungry, I felt a fragrance that I couldn't pass by. What is this dish? What is it called? We are cooking yantiks. Yantik? Yes, this is one of the national dishes of the Crimean Tatars. If you want to get acquainted with our culture, you must definitely try the dishes of the national cuisine. They are very tasty and varied. One of them is yantek. And how did this dish appear? It appeared a very long time ago during the Golden Horde. Then the soldiers needed a nutritious dish with meat, but it should have been prepared quickly. Once they heated their rama over fire, put meat wrapped in dough on them and baited like that, without oil. It was in about 12th, 13th centuries. This is how the Yantik dish appeared. It is similar to chaburek's. What is the difference? These are almost the same dishes, only the pastries are fried in oil and the yantik is baked in a chopped frying pan without oil. Therefore, the taste is different. Dear viewers, now I will transform into a cook. 
Now, together with Ms. Lutfier, we will prepare the national dish of the Crimean Tatars, Yantik. Will we start? First, we are making the dough. To do this, you need this is ready-made dough, and now I will show you the whole process of how to knead it. Pour in water. That's all to pour. Don't knead everything. A little will be enough. Of course, everyone knows how to make the dough. My mother also made it when I was a child. Therefore, I am calm. Ms. Lutfier proved that she is a true master. In a short time, the dough is ready. Now we turn to the stuffing. We make it from lamb or beef. Add finely chopped onion, salt and pepper. It turns out here is such a filling. Before wrapping in the dough, you need to add a little water here, so the filling will turn out juicy and the taste will be revealed. Now you need to roll out the dough. Let me handle the meat. I am a Kazakh. Will we make the dough now? You show me. I will try to repeat. I've never rolled dough before. We had to learn this on the Crimean Peninsula. They roll the dough, now it's time to do the stuffing. Spread the prepared filling on the dough in advance with an even layer. Then we connect the edges. Dear viewers, if during the preparation of the yantik you cannot find a special knife to make beautiful edges, you can use this plate. Such a life hack from us. So the most crucial moment has come. As we have already said, the main difference between a yantik and a cheburek is the method of preparation. Yantik is baked in a pan absolutely without oil. It is time to reap the benefits of my overwork. The national dish of the Crimean Tatars. Did I get a delicious yantik? Let's try. It is so delicious. A full stomach improves mood. However, I'm in good mood. Today has filled me with a sense of magic. Because in just one day I saw with my own eyes the primordial lands of the Crimean Tatars and have lived their history. I learned a lot of things that I have never heard about before. I walked through the places where the great rulers of the past stepped, whose names forever remained in history. It is probably impossible to describe these impressions with just words. What awaits me ahead? This we will learn together in the next episodes of the School of Nomads. <laughs>